So a very good day to one and all. I am Dr. Rohit Gopinath and today I will be talking about a very important topic as far as the surgeon is concerned, surgical site infections. Now surgical site infection remains the second most common complication following surgery, the first being pneumonias. Common sources of infection of a surgical wound include the basic surgical wards as such. If the wards are not kept clean, there is a very high chance that you can have an infection of the wound. Wound as such, if it is a contaminated wound, if the primary source of that particular wound is one of contamination or if there is a contamination of the wound prior to you addressing the surgical condition, again chance of infection is very high. Presence of catheters, drains, etc. again can induce an infection of the wound. Sputum, urine, feces, surgical personnel who are not properly sterilized, who do not uh, adopt the normal sterilization protocols, again can uh, induce an infection of a wound. Operation methods, if the method by which the procedure has been done is not one of great, uh, is, if it is not done meticulously or you have excessive handling of tissues, then there is very high chance that the wound can get infected. And last but not the least, the most important factor is the sterilization of instruments. If the instruments used during the surgical procedure are not adequately sterilized, there is a very high chance that the wound can get infected. So common organisms which lead on to wound infection are as always it is gram positive. And the commonest gram positive organisms which can lead on to wound infection are Staphylococcus aureus and Streptococcus pyogenes. Others like Clostridial species, certain gram negative organisms are also capable of causing uh, wound infections, but it is usually the source of infection is not from the surrounding skin, but from some other contamination either feces or from mud etc. Always remember that one of the most common sources of organism to which, uh, which would end up in causing a wound infection is from the surrounding skin. So if during any operative procedure, keeping the surrounding skin clean is of great importance. So before we go on to what exactly a surgical site infection is, it is very important that we understand few terminologies. The first terminology is contamination. So what do you call contamination? So here the bacteria are located on the wound surface, but they are not actively dividing. Colonization. So colonization is the presence of bacteria on a wound and these bacteria are in a state of constant division. Topical infections or critical colonization as you can call it. Here the bacteria are dividing and they invade the wound surface and you find that but there is no involvement of deeper tissues or surrounding tissues. Local infection. Here the bacteria along with their products have invaded the local tissue but the surrounding normal tissue is not affected. When you have affection, when the surrounding normal tissue is affected, then it is called as regional or spreading infections or cellulitis. You call it sepsis if the bacteria and their products enter into the bloodstream and have spread to different organs or sites. The importance of surgical site infections has been emphasized time and again by many doctors for centuries now. In fact, right from the days of Gallen, importance of uh, achieving, so identifying surgical site infections and achieving antisepsis has been given utmost importance. Gallen was the first one who proposed that any suppuration requires treatment in the form of drainage. So basically, in his term, what he said that any abscess requires incision and drainage. So this basic concept was first propounded by Gallen. Ambrose Pare emphasized the importance of keeping any wound clean because prior to this it was practiced in many religions and areas to apply mud, cow dung over wounds which led on to extensive wound related complications. So Ambro Ambrose Pare emphasized the importance of keeping any wound clean. Then came Koch and Koch gave his famous postulates. So his Koch's postulates had four important points to it. So he said that to term an organism has been the causative agent of an infectious process. It is necessary to be one, it is necessary that this organism should be seen in all cases of that particular infection. Second, you should be able to isolate the organism and grow it in a culture outside the body. Third, when you introduce this organism into another person, that person should show signs and symptoms 
of that particular infectious condition. Four, and in this person in whom you have instilled the organism, you should be able to re-isolate the organism and grow it in culture. So, these were the four postulates of Koch. But of course, there are exceptions to any postulate and even in this case, there were exceptions. For example, if you have an organism of low virulence, then that particular organism is very unlikely to cause an infection in an immunocompetent person. Whereas in an immunocompromised person, again, a low virulence organism can cause extensive infection. And certain organisms, we may not be able to culture it as easily as others. For example, like mycobacterium tuberculosis, certain anaerobic organisms, mycobacterium leprae, clostridial species, etc. So, these are organisms where you find that isolating it and culturing it may not be as easy. So, these are some of the exceptions to Cox postulates. Dr. Ignac Semmelweis, who was a very famous obstetrician, emphasized the importance of hand wash in preventing puperal sepsis. He found that in obstetric wards, just by hand wash, the incidence of puperal sepsis could be brought down from 10% to less than 2%. However, it is a common dictum that genius is always recognized late. So, this person, Ignac Semmelweis, was never accepted and his theory of hand wash was not given enough importance during his lifetime. In fact, he died at the age of 47 in a mental asylum. And now, hand wash is being brought up in a big way as a method to control infections. Louis Pasteur postulated the germ theory and Impressed by the germ theory which was propounded by Louis Pasteur, one of the students who, were, who was sitting in the dais as Louis Pasteur was postulating his germ theory, Dr. Joseph Lister, he started using antiseptic agents to achieve asepsis or antisepsis. The, common, the first antiseptic agent that Joseph Lister used was carbolic acid. Since then, up to number of antiseptic agents have been developed and it is being used extensively now. We live in an era where antibiotics are available left, right and center. But then, there was a time when we did not have this luxury. So, during this time was developed a wonder drug as it was called or a magic pill, sulfonamide. So, sulfonamide was labeled the wonder drug because it was capable of curing most of the infectious diseases without much of an adverse effect to the patient taking those pills. After the development of sulfonamide, Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin. But then there is a huge difference between discovering something and then bringing it into practice. So, even though Alexander Fleming was able to isolate, was able to discover penicillin in the late 1920s, isolation of the organism and provision of that drug to the general public could be achieved only in the late 1940s. So, a difference of almost 18 years, 18 to 20 years between identifying and isolating. So, the first penicillin dosage was given to a constable called Alexander who actually had uh, developed staphylococcal sepsis following an injury while pruning roses. However, the truth is that he succumbed to the infection nevertheless because the dose of penicillin that could be given to him was very minimal. But then it heralded a new era of extremely safe antibiotics.